Hello, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Cyrus Patel, I teach here at NYU Abu Dhabi in the literature program, and it is my great pleasure to welcome to the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, Professor Stephanie Le Menager, who uh, is going to discuss a topic that should be discussed, I think, more often and more widely, the Anthropocene, which is the name that's been given to the epic that we probably have now entered, in which human beings have significantly altered the Earth's geology and ecosystems by causing things like the mass extinction of animals and plants, pollution of the air and sky, global warming, and of course with it, climate change. Professor Le Manager comes, from us, comes to us from the University of Oregon, where she is the Barbara and Carlisle Moore Distinguished Professor in English and American Literature and also Professor of Environmental Studies. In 2014, Oxford University Press published her study, Living Oil, Petroleum Culture in the American Century, in which she investigated how oil came to play what she called a foundational role in the American imagination and therefore in the future life of life on Earth because of the global projection of American power during the 20th century. And she argues there that oil itself is a medium that fundamentally supports all modern media forms concerned with what counts as culture, from film to recorded music, novels, magazines, photographs, sports, and the wikis, blogs, and videography, she says, of the internet. And so she asked, can the category of the human persist, practically speaking, without such forms which are indebted to fossil fuels? Professor Le Manager is now currently at work on a book project that focuses on the ecological significance of the humanities in the era of global climate change. And tonight's talk, Climate Change and Novel Experience, draws on that research. Um, she also has an, an essay entitled The American Novel and Anthropocene Experience, which is going to appear in the forthcoming eighth volume of the Oxford History of the Novel in English, which deals with US fiction after 1940, and which I have the privilege of co-editing with Deborah Lindsay Williams, who is the head of the Literature and Creative Writing Program here. And finally, a piece on Octavia E. Butler's novel, Parable of the Sower, by Professor Le Manager, has just been published today on the website of the Electra Street Arts and Humanities Journal. And if you're interested in having a look at that, the URL is electrostreet, one word, dot net. And tomorrow night, Professor Le Manager will be participating in a post-show panel after the performance of Toshi Regan's opera version of Parable of a Sower. And the other panel, panelists will be Toshi Regan herself, um, Sarah Sun, the director of the next student production of the Aeneid, uh, which will be taking place next week over in the Art Center. Sophia Kalanzatikos, who is the director of NYU Abu Dhabi's Earth Humanities Initiatives, and Professor Williams. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Stephanie LeMenager. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you to my generous hosts here at NYU Abu Dhabi, and particularly uh, Professors Patel and Williams, who've been terrific. Uh, to work with while I've been here. So let me start by just uh, showing you something that you may not want to see. Maybe you've been seeing too many of these. I know that we have in the US. Um, this is a tweet from my president, Donald J. Trump, that the poet Eileen Miles chose to um, rebroadcast on Instagram a while back. And the tweet says, as you can see, literature is fake news that stays news. And Eileen Miles, the poet, responded to this by saying, Trump, no poet. True enough. However, um, I found this to be one of my president's more interesting tweets, actually, because I do think he has a point that literature um, stays news. What do I mean by that? Well, literature doesn't tend to erode as quickly as lies, tweets, or alternative facts injected in the news cycle. Literature may not succeed in outlasting news, but typically, it aspires to do so, and of course, I'm speaking very broadly when I talk about literature. I'm talking about poetry and novels and essays. I'm speaking so broadly that probably some of my colleagues would raise an eyebrow or two at me. But at its most potent, I think, literature captures public feelings which are not measurable by crude instruments, such as polling. Political polling is something that we do all the time in the US, and it turns out that it doesn't really tell us very much about the structures of feeling that underlie our culture. Literature represents facts too complex or long in the making to be taken as news, and it hints at ways of being social, which sometimes are not yet visible to the world that at any given moment has been agreed upon as reality. So 
All that to say um, that at least there's one tweet this year that I can agree with. <laughs> so I want to start by talking a little bit about what I'm going to call a politics of life. Rather than fall down the rabbit hole of news, real or fake, I'd like to suggest a few key strategies for building a politics of life this evening. And to do so, I think, will be to engage not in propaganda or narrowly strategic fictions, but to commit ourselves to the world building and civic engagement of living in the present, which means, among other things, living climate change. Living climate change names the everyday dimensions for me, of an ambitious cultural project, which has been carried out by artists, by activists, by ordinary people, by writers. Um, and, and it's been carried out for quite a long time now, actually, since climate change has been a part of the popular imaginary internationally since at least the 1980s. Now, I've named this project of living climate change, for the purposes of this talk at least, a civics for the sixth extinction. And I've written about it most distinctly as a literary project that takes up from the ambitions of the 19th century and early 20th century social novel, particularly insofar as the American social novel promoted a pluralistic humanism predicated upon the absorption of novel experience, broad empathy across caste and class, the mixing of immigrant cultures, and the ability to turn accidents into occasions for transformative change. The civic responsibilities that are upon us in a time of climate change are not easy to imagine. Um, this is a difficult time in which ocean acidification, mass extinction, desert desertification, and other issues make it very hard to know how to practice civic responsibility. Yet climate change cultures have been in development, again, for some time, as I noted, across disciplinary boundaries in academia, across print and digital cultures, and across national borders as well. So I want to talk first about what I'm just describing here is the journey from climate science to cultures of climate change and how that particular um, journey works. The literary and cultural work of scientists in both the former Soviet Union and the US brought us the Anthropocene idea. Uh, it was actually scientists in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, apparently, who first used the term, though they didn't mean by it exactly what Professor Patel um, described to us now, which is when we think of the Anthropocene now, we think of it as this, this cultural epic and geologic epic, perhaps, where humans are understood to be the drivers of the climate, the drivers of geological change at the planetary scale. But the Anthropocene idea was brought to us earlier than today, earlier than uh, the recent moment, um, by both the US and Soviet scientists. And it's been interesting to think about how this idea has gathered up a lot of current philosophical thinking around the question of climate and how climate change can be both absorbed and um, responded to in, by culture. Um, does everybody know what the Anthropocene is? I know we've talked a little bit about it, but does anybody want a further riff on it before I go forward? Okay. So the Anthropocene idea has been a potent metaphor uh, and a kind of complement, if not inspiration, to current philosophical thinking about human and non-human agency and collaboration. Now, I use the Anthropocene myself to organize a diverse body of climate change cultural work. Um, but at the same time that I use the Anthropocene idea, I have to acknowledge that the concept of the Anthropocene pivots around the idea of a universal anthropos, or human. And I don't actually believe that such a universal human exists, per se. The Anthropocene idea obscures important aspects of living with climate change, including the precariousness of non-human lives in the moment uh, of the sixth mass extinction, and the relevance of our histories of colonialism to the Anthropocene epic. There are scientists such as Mark A. Maslin and Simon Lewis who've talked explicitly about how the Anthropocene could be dated to the time of, new, uh, of co colonialism in the Americas. Um, that's been a very controversial um, proposal for, for dating the Anthropocene, but it's one that deeply engages the question of colonialism in planetary geology, and that's something I'd be happy to talk more about later. 
So the Anthropocene usefully sums up what is, it has meant for many humans to recognize just how much we inadvertently have driven the conditions of our own thriving. And I think that's one of the things about the Anthropocene idea that's really frustrating. It's about all of this power that humans have exerted on the planet, but it's power that is inadvertent and to some extent accidental. It's not what our best laid plans brought uh, into being in fruition, but it's actually what um, kind of accidentally and collaterally occurred as modernity, as we know it, uh, came into being. So the Anthropocene sums up certain conditions that are important to think about, and it introduces, to some degree, what we might call a new genre of humanism. And I'm using the, the phrase genre of humanism after the post-colonial theorist Sylvia Winter, whom I'll quote a little bit later on in this talk. Before we in the US had the Anthropocene idea to index our astonishment and loss, Bill McKibben, the popular science writer, prepared the way for it in his book, The End of Nature, which in 1989 was the first popular account of climate science for a broad English-speaking audience. And in the early 1990s, the New York Times science writer, Andrew Revkin, brought us the Anthropocene idea, a kind of early predecessor to the Anthropocene, which was in part inspired by Revkin's engagement with the NASA scientist James Hansen, and particularly James Hansen's public testimony about the greenhouse effect on the Senate floor of the US uh, Congress. So the award-winning science fiction writers Kim Stanley Robinson and Octavia Butler both read the work of climate scientists and responded to their findings in some of the best and uh, first climate fiction or cli-fi, as did the climate change denialist Michael Crichton, whose novel A State of Fear uh, was introduced to the second Bush White House by Karl Rove. And it's interesting, um, State of Fear is one of the novels that comes up again and again as a very early example of climate fiction or cli-fi. It's a novel that in many respects refutes the idea of climate change uh, as even a, a real you know, scientific um, event and series of events. Octavia Butler, who wrote The Parable of the Sower, which of course is the basis in novel form for Toshi Regan's opera, is a very early um, climate uh, fiction writer, somebody who was corresponding with climate scientists uh, for a long time during the 1980s and then produced a really interesting account of the social as well as ecological consequences of climate transition and climate shift. Ken Stanley Robinson similarly thought a great deal about the science of climate change, uh, and it was on the basis of his own scientific reading that he began to produce a series of novels that have been called, in retrospect, cli-fi. So these people are, I, I use the word imagineers with a little bit of irony, frankly. I lived in California perhaps too long, and words like this came right out of Disney and right out of Hollywood, uh, and then Silicon Valley, too. But I think these are people who were imagining scenarios very early within the popular imaginary, anyway, of climate change about what climate change is gonna look like as a socio-ecological problem and how we might address it. Um, and I wanna just go back to an image that I didn't show you, which is an image described simply as Anthropocene. Um, this is very famous. I don't know how many people have actually seen this. Has, have any, has anybody seen this before? This has been used on a lot of book covers uh, that describe the Anthropocene including a terrific collection out of Rutledge, which is about the environmental humanities in the Anthropocene. Um, it's a wonderful sculpture park or sculptural museum that's um, off of Cancun, Mexico, where the sculptor Jason DeCares Taylor, a British sculptor, created uh, a series of Anthropocene uh, images that one can, can see and touch as a diver. So I'm thinking a little bit about, again, the literary and cultural work of science and how climate scientists themselves have refined the sometimes bombastic Anthropocene idea. The Anthropocene idea can be a little bit um, too invested in the hubris of the human, the idea of our, our powerful, our, excuse me, our all-powerfulness. Uh, and scientists tend to really work against that. There's a certain humility that has to do with, you know, I think, doing a lot of peer review science. So climate scientists have brought to the Anthropocene idea humility. Uh, a kind of a focus on witnessing, and also a, a focus on the necessity of a generative or productive grief. 
as scientific discoveries regarding glacial retreat and ocean acidification and habitat loss promise significant climate-related extinctions and underline the potentials for human suffering. And there's been a lot of work done, in the United States anyway, on the depression of climate scientists, people who are working on these issues all the time and seeing diminishment as a result of climate uh, shift. And uh, the psychological effects of that are apparently quite profound. So climate scientists have brought, again, a humility and a uh, focus on empiricism and the necessity of witnessing to an Anthropocene idea that can sometimes be a little bit um, bombastic, as I said. Now, the biologist Mark C. Urban has written about extinction in relation to climate change in this way. <clears throat> he says, extinction risks from climate change are expected not only to increase, but to accelerate for every degree rise in global temperatures. And he goes on to talk about how climate change-related extinction is particularly problematic for South America, New Zealand, and Australia. Um, when we talk about the sixth mass extinction, we're talking about habitat loss that's resultant from various factors, but climate change is one of them. So as Urban writes about climate change, he's just telling us a series of facts that he has understood as a scientist. But then when those facts are translated by somebody like Elizabeth Colbert uh, into a popular scientific account of extinction, what happens is that we become witnesses, as Colbert has said in an interview about her work on the sixth mass extinction. She says, we're really here to experience a kind of collective grief and to sort of think about how it can be that we grieve for species loss. How do we, as individuals or as communities, think through in a productive way the losses that the planet itself is enduring at this point in time? That's a difficult question. And when I talk about grief, I'm not talking about kind of crying into one's soup and not doing anything and becoming paralyzed by grief. But I'm talking about the kind of grief that really brings you to a better understanding and consciousness of what is happening in this world and that can create a kind of activism. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk briefly about an exhibit called Is This How You Feel? Um, that's an exhibit that was created by uh, a, an environmental science communications student at the university, um, it's the National University, I think, Australian National University in Australia. And this student was named Joe Duggan. Joe Duggan decided that it was a good idea to humanize climate scientists, to give people who are not climate scientists a sense of the, the psychological effects of doing climate science in the hopes that there would be more of a sense of urgency if the larger public could see what climate scientists see and also could feel what they feel about their findings. So this exhibit called Is This How You Feel is an exhibit that was um, <clears throat> mainly curated on the web. And the link that I have here is the way that you can get to it. But it also has been printed out and exhibited um, at one of the only climate change museums that's actually uh, up and running in this world. And that's the Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change. Uh, of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. There is a climate change museum in New York, which seems to be more of an idea space at this point in time. And I believe that the Museum of the Future, which is uh, coming in Dubai, is also going to have a significant component about climate change. So it's interesting to think about curating the future or curating the present moment um, as a moment of loss, of transition, of grief, but also of simply shared public feelings about the transition that climate change represents. So I won't read to you any of the specific testimony of the scientists, but I would suggest that you might want to take a look at this exhibit online. You can find scientists from all parts of the world talking about their experiences. And it's just a very uh, powerful testimony to what it means to be closely in touch with a set of scientific facts that imply, again, profound transition. So, Dynamic climate change cultures have moved from the scientific community through popular science writing and activism and into fiction, film, and philosophy. These energetic, if unevenly informed cultures pursue no less than a way of being human, being human ethically, politically, philosophically, ecologically, in a time of almost unthinkable planetary change. My own focus as a scholar activist has been on climate change culture making and climate change culture making through literature and the arts because my training is in literature uh, and the arts. 
Scholars like the literary historian Adam Trexler, who did the first book-length work on climate fiction, and activists such as the cli-fi promoter Dan Bloom, a tireless promoter of the idea of cli-fi, who's based in Taiwan, have uncovered roughly 300 climate-related novels. This is rather amazing, given that climate change, again, didn't really enter the popular imaginary until the 1980s in any profound way. I myself have counted hundreds of print and spoken word climate change poems, over a dozen feature films and art exhibits, three devoted climate museums, two still in production phase, um, and there are hundreds of aspirational climate bohemias as well, like the transition town of Totnes, England, and activist groups dedicated to uh, energy transition and other modes of social justice that will be kind of folded in to energy transition and systemic change. Some of these cultural expressions have strong material consequences. For instance, the transition towns, which is a movement that's worldwide but that started in England, some of those towns are already running on 100% renewables. So there are these very local pockets of infrastructure change as well as cultural change and a kind of attitudinal change toward the way that we think about energy, modernity, and pleasure. All of these cultural expressions cultivate an affirmative path forward, choosing life over nostalgia and denial. I myself am not very interested in apocalyptic modes of thought, although apocalypse originally was to some degree a genre that was meant to spur action. Um, but I do think apocalypse has been profoundly overused by environmental thinkers uh, to the point where when you hear an apocalyptic environmental scenario, um, it may just simply result in a kind of paralysis and wish to turn away from the person delivering it. So the plural and productive cultures of climate change, I should say, aren't really news, by which I mean that I'm not the first person to notice that these cultures exist, nor do I often see them reflected in news media outside of dedicated climate venues. My hope is to put this productive civic work in the foreground of contemporary imagination by simply talking about it a lot. And there are many of us who are doing just that. So far, cli-fi, which is the genre of speculative fiction devoted to imagining climate change, has garnered more mainstream press than any other cultural expression that I've been in touch with. And I've had a really odd relationship with the creation of this genre called cli-fi because I first heard about it when the New York Times got in touch with me about it. I got a, an email from a New York Times reporter, which I thought maybe was actually specious. I thought maybe it wasn't even a real email, asking me to talk with him. He was coming through Oregon about this new literary genre that he'd heard about. And we sat down and had lunch when he came through Oregon, and we were talking about you know, what cli-fi is, how we would define its parameters. We looked at a set of eight different books that he and I had picked out together as exemplary. And as we were talking, it became very clear to me that here was a reporter from you know, one of the world's best known newspapers who felt that a genre, a form of fiction was necessary for cultural progress, if not survival. This is the first time as a literature professor in my life that I've ever experienced that sense that what we actually do as writers, that what actually happens in the classroom, for instance, when you think through fictional scenarios, could really have a biological as well as ecological importance. Um, that imagining things that had not yet come into being and, and our reactions to them uh, as human beings, our social reactions, the kind of structures that might come, uh, come into fruition when climate shift begins to happen, or as it's already happening, the things that are are coming into being. This became a, a real obsession, not just for the New York Times, but also for Time Magazine, um, for Climate Wire, which is a, a, a journal that's normally very policy oriented, but suddenly they were doing a lot of stories on climate fiction and on digital media that was calling people together to create collective stories of climate change and climate and, and thriving and surviving through climate change. So this new literary genre had a very powerful um, media component to it that, that surprised me, but made me think, what is it about this idea of a genre that is so appealing in this moment of transition? So my own response um, has been not to really see climate fiction, for instance, as um, something that's going to change the national dialogue in the United States. We, we all probably know that the United States is a, is a big climate-denying nation. But what I have 
thought about with climate fiction is that it gives us a sense of shadow political communities, I might call them shadow climate nations, that express themselves either internationally or at the margins of US national debate, almost at the sub-national level. And this project of living climate change is necessarily, to my mind, both local and international. My explicit focus remains the United States, both because it's my own area of study, and also because the US remains one of the world's most influential climate change deniers. The story of American climate change cultures, as told even by advocates, remains one of a kind of continual undermining of certainty. So there's been a lot of work that's been done on this problem of what's called scams, or scientific certainty argumentation methods. Methods meant to question scientific consensus that tend to pervade the lobbying circles of Washington, DC. Naomi Oreskes, who's a terrific historian of science at Harvard University, has written about these so-called scams, uh, as have other sociologists and, and historians. Um, so when we think about climate change cultures in the US, we're often thinking about all of the the rhetoric, all of the narrative, all of the politically motivated talk and story that undermines climate science. And I think that even though that is the case and that such things exist, it's also important to keep in mind that even in the United States, the world's largest climate denying nation, we have a really distinct set of variations on how much people actually believe that climate change is real and that it's occurring. You can see this is from the Yale um, University Climate Communication website, where they look at the different uh, levels of alarm, concern, caution, and, and engagement that Americans register. Uh, there's also a terrific map that Yale put out that shows, interestingly enough, that in regions that have been affected by climate change, people are more likely to believe in it. So sometimes a region such as South Texas might be very conservative politically, it might not be a place where people like Al Gore uh, or Democrats or, or big government or any of the things that have come to be associated with climate change in the United States, but it is a place where people are experiencing extreme flooding, extreme storms, uh, insurance companies are not wanting to insure properties anymore um, on the Gulf Coast. So there's all kinds of issues there that bring about the possibility of belief. And we really have many different levels of belief and many different levels of certainty. So even though the uncertainty is what is being sown politically in the world, that's not everything that is out there by any means. Um, I myself have been very interested in stories um, in the newspaper and elsewhere in sociological study about the so-called cool white dudes. Um, these are conservative white males who tend to be highly averse to the facts of climate science. They're very aware of the climate science, they're knowledgeable people, informed people, but simply averse to the idea that climate change is real and the science that proves it. Now, ironically, Monsanto and other big agricultural companies have had a really hard time with the so-called cool white dudes who don't believe in climate change um, because big agriculture has been creating seeds meant to thrive in climate changing conditions. And they wanna advertise those seeds and other products but they don't know how to use the, the language of climate change or whether they can use it to advertise the need for the products they're creating. So how do they create a rhetoric? How do they create a language or a story that can somehow appeal to people who don't want to hear the term climate change? Um, what's interesting about this particular problem that Big Ag is having is that on the other side of the coin, the farmers themselves in the US who may be voting for people who are denying climate change also know that climate change is happening because they're working very intimately with the earth. And of course they recognize changing conditions and have much more sensitivity to seasonal variation than people who do not work uh, the earth as farmers have. So we have a, a, an interesting culture of, of sort of what Mike Hume, the British geographer, would call weather culturists, people who are very much connected to the cultures of weather and understand it and yet can't use the term climate change for political purposes. Um, that discrepancy is one that I think makes very clear the role that culture and sort of one story of oneself and, and sense of identity has to play in um, mitigating climate denial and making a larger conversation possible. So in some of the most well-known calls um, by environmentalist authors to think about 
climate change and to imagine a positive climate change politics. For instance, analyses of Anthropocene culture by the Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh in his wonderful book, The Great Derangement, and the American journalist Roy Scranton. Uh, the rich history of international climate cultures doesn't really come through. These are both really interesting and profoundly provocative books, one very much based in the US, one based in South Asia, but with a strong cosmopolitan uh, horizon. Um, why do Ghosh and Scranton not really want to talk about the more affirmative movements and, and modes of thought that have come up around climate change as a problem? They lament widespread despair. They talk about the bad dystopian fictions of climate change, and there certainly are those. And they talk about also naive activism, with Scranton con conceiving a transcendental civilizational suicide as a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, almost necessity for the modern West. The shunting aside of populist events like the People's Climate March of 2014 by both men indulges a cynicism unworthy of the shadow climate nations, the diverse climate publics even, who live and work alongside a cynicism which has become so characteristic of American politics and to some degree politics in other parts of the world. The California activist Rebecca Solnit once wisely suggested, I think, that cynicism is a form of impatience. And I'd like to also suggest that cynicism can be a stay against grief. Um, so I love the books by Scranton and Ghosh. Actually, these are both books that I teach that I find really interesting and provocative. They're books that make clear that culture is part of the problem here. Um, but in, in Ghosh's case, um, he's very critical of literature, uh, and particularly genre fiction that can handle the kind of jolts that climate change itself brings to a plot when disastrous things occur. Um, Scranton simply seems to think about you know, the, the sort of eclipse of Western humanism as the end of a, of a world. And his interest in civilizational suicide is provocative, but to me, um, it doesn't really lead to a form of action or even a form of grief that I can uh, find productive. So I want to talk a bit about fossil fuel nostalgia and climate grief. Now, um, Professor Patel mentioned that my last book was titled Living Oil. And my next book is going to be about living climate change through what I call novel experience, by which I mean novelistic genres, some digital, some performative, and some print, that attempt to shepherd a new genre of climate change humanism into being. For me, living means to be enmeshed in material circumstances which are multi-scalar, which are dynamic, which are productive of affect and emotion, and which open to transformative change. Both books take part in the pursuit of the everyday structures of feeling that encourage cultural habit in a given period. Um, and there's a picture in my book, Living Oil, uh, which I borrowed a, an image from um, uh, the film Giant for, uh, an image that very much captures, I think, both the kind of passionate attachment to oil that's a part of West Texas culture, and, and because of West Texas culture, a part of America culture more broadly, but also the sense of almost drowning in one's own ecstatic oil discovery, as James Dean does here in this particular still. Now, as I said, both books are interested in how everyday structures of feeling, everyday habits, in a way, create certain kinds of cultural conditions, uh, attitudes, and political possibilities. The new book's implicit message is that, as I once wrote in an essay called The Sustainable Humanities, Earth needs the humanities. But the new book is not a defense of my own or any academic field. It merely restates the arts and humanities role in concert with the social and natural sciences in cultivating what I would call an aspirational humanism, a human tendency, this is a phrase my students like, capable of living on and cultivating other life through radical climate disruptions. When I wrote Living Oil, I curated uh, a, an archive of visual, cinematic, and literary artifacts that show the early 21st century United States in the grip of a feeling state that I call petromelancholia. And petromelancholia, for me, is an unresolved grieving for fossil fuels and the version of North American modernity that cheap energy brought into being in the 20th century US. So it's a melancholy about you know, missing that moment of uh, energy extraction when energy was a lot easier to get than it is now. The relatively cheap energy of the American mid 20th century was easier to extract than shale or tar sands oil. And this cheap energy enabled many forms of progressive culture in the United States, it, it, from environmentalism to feminism to modern art. 
Petromelancholia describes a structure of feeling touching deep attachments to energy infrastructures. And it's my argument that energy infrastructures are also, of course, cultural infrastructures. And they're psychological infrastructures. They're uh, very, very deep. Of Petromelancholia, uh, I wrote, and I'm quoting here, what impedes the productive grieving of oil if we're to follow Freud in supposing that grief should be superseded by the taking of a new object is that we, by which I mean myself and most Americans, refuse to acknowledge that conventional oil is running out, at least in our own country, and that tough oil isn't the same resource in terms of economic, social, and biological costs. Denial inhibits mourning and a passage forward. And the petroleum infrastructure has become embodied memory um, for modern humans. And so far as everyday events like driving to the grocery store or feeling the summer heat of asphalt on the soles of your feet are repeated performances that become encoded in the body. Decoupling our body's memory from the infrastructures that sustain it may be the primary challenge to ecological emotion and climate action into the 21st century. The poignant and real North American grief for jobs in coal country or the Rust Belt or northern Alberta has degraded across corporate and social media into a kind of libertarian meme that fossil fuel regulation is an insult to personal freedom. So in the grip of petromelancholia, I would argue, uh, we forego what could be a productive morning following China, for instance, into a multi-billion dollar renewables industry in favor of contrarian symbolic performances. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about something that you may know about or may not know about it, something that actually happened to me. I was driving in Texas, as I sometimes do, because I have family there, uh, in a Prius from Dallas, Texas, up to Denton. And all of a sudden, I couldn't see, and I couldn't figure out why. I was like I was enclosed in a black cloud, and I didn't know what was going on. And it turned out that I was a victim of rolling coal. Coal was being rolled upon me. What is rolling coal? Well, rolling coal is one of these symbolic performances I'm talking about that I think is related to this sort of complex of petromelancholia, where people are really interested in sort of showing their personal freedom by showing their allegiance to an older fossil fuel infrastructure that involves coal as well. So when you roll coal, you practice, you, you engage in the practice of modifying a diesel engine to increase the amount of fuel entering the engine in order to emit an under-aspirated sooty exhaust that visibly pollutes the air. It also might include uh, the intentional removal of the particulate filter, and it can cost between two and $5,000 to alter a vehicle in Texas, for instance, so that it will produce this sooty exhaust. Um, and it's really theatrical and remarkable to be a part of it. It's, it's almost like being in a theatrical event on the highway when you get rolled on with coal. Um, and you know, it it's, it's sort of shows you a little bit, I guess, kind of as an insight into American psychology right now in relation to energy systems and energy transition. The Prius is the car that's most likely to be rolled on by a coal roller because it implies this new infrastructure, this new way of thinking about energy that eclipses an older fossil fuel uh, culture. And it's a profoundly, you know, kind of interesting cultural expression, um, <laughs> to put it mildly. So the cultural critic Stacey Alimo gives the name of carbon masculinity to a complex of gendered energy expressions that she sees uh, in rolling coal, for instance, uh, even in some of our um, invasive uh, movements in the Middle East, uh, in wars, uh, and then the sort of mundane cultural pleasures that are part of the United States culture, such as the great uh, pleasure of NASCAR. For many Americans, NASCAR is our national association for stock car auto racing. Carbon masculinity has, in other words, many kinds of expressive forms from very serious and, and potentially damaging ones to ones that are a little bit more, I guess I'll say playful, although you could potentially get in an accident if somebody spews this amount of soot on you. Um, carbon masculinity is an interesting thing to think about too in relation to our current president from the petroleum-based styling products that maintain the iconic sweep of his hair, for instance, to his interest in Arctic oil and his poignant campaign promise to rebuild the coal industry in Appalachia which is the mountainous region where you know, the coal industry was very uh, important for many, many decades, we can see ourselves in the US in the grip of a carbon masculinity that is absolutely steeped in petromelancholia. 
Um, and I think it's interesting to imagine how gender is undergirded by energy infrastructures, how gender performances are actually related to uh, energy infrastructure in various ways. Um, I was out in the Permian Basin, which is a big oil producing region in West Texas just about six weeks ago, and I happened upon a, a wedding in the midst of the Petroleum Museum in Midland, Texas. And I should mention as a disclaimer that my father was in the oil industry for a while, so I'm not, if it seems like I'm just mocking these people, I'm actually one of them in, in some respects, and this is why I'm so fascinated by it. Um, but I went out to the Petroleum Museum. I was asked to be part of a, a really interesting project the University of Texas is putting on called Boom or Bust, and it's about how people in Texas are living through the boom-bust economy of the oil industry, particularly as oil resources really change um, in Texas. And they're asking people in the industry to tell their stories. You know, what is it like to work in this industry? What is it like to live in the precariousness of boom or bust? Well, while I was out there, I saw a very beautiful, but to me also kind of poignant wedding taking place amidst the ruins of the 20th century oil industry. These historic derricks, historic um, trucks, and other kinds of oil machinery uh, were the, the setting for this young couple's wedding. And again, that just, to me, raises the question of how do we think about gender and, and all kinds of social interaction as structured by, informed by, and informing um, our energy systems. Uh, this question has been asked by many people, not just by me, and one of the more interesting projects that's come up is a project by an artist named Brett Bloom, who is located now in Fort Wayne, Indiana, right in the middle of the United States. He's done a project he calls Petrosubjectivity, or Deindustrializing the Self, where he brings people to workshops that he calls Breakdown Breakdowns, where he tries to make a kind of space where it becomes possible to imagine yourself without fossil fuels undergirding your life and culture. This apparently is so hard to do, and I find it very difficult to do, that um, he started to try to get people to imagine very specific alternative possibilities, the one that he likes to, to play with as a kind of speculative, almost theater, is horsepower. What would it be like to actually live with physical horsepower as your sort of primary mode of energy and transportation and not everything that we come to associate with a modern fossil fuel uh, system? So this is a conceptual artist. He can be a little bit playful with horsepower. Um, he can be a little bit playful, too, in, in sort of asking us to break down our psychological dependencies on one of the root sources of modernity, as, as most of us understand it. Um, I want to talk briefly, uh, just in, in um, conclusion, about what I call serious fantasy. And this is related to the idea of fantasy fiction. Um, what does it mean to live climate change as serious fantasy is the question that guides this section of my talk. So the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler in his book Taking Care of Youth and the Generations eloquently outlines a concern that's also present in climate fiction and Anthropocene philosophy. In brief, Stiegler laments the interruption of acts of intergenerational communication acts of storytelling, acts of play between generations, by corporate media, the interruption of those acts by corporate media that call us to attention through sensuous portable devices, devices such as this. Um, he's interested in talking about what he calls uh, the threat to fantasy that is presented by this kind of sensuous portable device. His concern is that in his words, fantasy, humanity's most precious gift, the gift of play and mutuality that engenders human culture has been captured and constrained by so-called psychotechnologies that assume responsibility for our attention. What this means is that a trans-individual reality, that's his term, trans-individual reality, being a reality that kind of comes about through intergenerational communication and education. Uh, you know, I teach my niece something that my grandmother taught me, the, the wisdom of those who are now dead, comes to those who are going to be the future. That kind of intergenerational trans-individual reality is being interrupted by psychotechnologies, according to Stiegler. So the intergenerational relationship at the foundation of what has been known as education fails. 
What interests me about his argument is that it's actually not simply another lament about fairly uh, affluent children's attention being drawn away by digital devices. That's not the, pro the sort of profound part of the argument, I think. What's more interesting about the argument to me is that it's an argument about the destruction of the social category of the adult, whose primary meaning lies in training the attention of the young. The responsibility and, uh, that imbued adulthood as a unique social status has been ceded to psychotechnologies making adults irrelevant, according to this argument. Stiegler's lament shares some of the concerns, interestingly enough, of indigenous philosophers who recognize that the loss of tribal sovereignties has meant the loss of the right to be responsible for their future generations through the practice of traditional knowledges. I don't want to lump these things together uh, too simply, but at the center of climate change culture in many forms is the question of how to educate and a real fear that education is becoming uh, almost impossible. And the anxiety that Holocene-born parents can no longer educate our children in such a way as to further their chances of survival permeates the writings of climate change culture, which is also the culture of corporatized social media. That double whammy, social media and its interruptive calls to attention, plus the unprecedented geologic abyss of a new climate era, makes for a problem of transgenerational knowledge transfer perhaps more disturbing than any other social aspect of climate change. A colleague of mine at the University of Oregon named Kari Norgard has talked about what she says is the ontological insecurity that comes about when we think of climate change and that creates climate change denial. Her point is that it's really, uh, we're looking at a kind of change in the very structure of our being as humans when we think about climate changing and the kinds of adjustments, structural adjustments that have to be made to address that. So she feels that people want to deny climate change or simply not think about it, even if we're believers, to sort of put it aside, because it really, its, it's reality really goes to the very heart of our sense of being in the world. So this ontological insecurity that Norgard recognizes from her ethnographic work in Norway as the crux of living in climate change denial in the global north relates, I think, to a fear that we may no longer know how to teach our children what humans should be or how human as a biological uh, and, and cultural category can thrive. It's not only the specter of climate change, qua climate change, that initiates this ontological insecurity, but all the other social and material events entangled in our global changing cultures, from resource wars to aggressive industrial extraction to racial and ethnic scapegoating. One of the most brilliant adult dystopian fictions and fantasies of climate change culture is a novel called uh, The Uninvited by Liz Jensen. <clears throat> this novel begins with what seems an unconnected rash of murders by preteen children and destructive attacks on corporate property, which are committed by adults who claim to be possessed by child ghosts. And then after committing these attacks on corporate property, the adults kill themselves. As the novel proceeds, its narrator, who's an evolutionary anthropologist, attempts to find scientific explanations for what becomes a violent pandemic. It turns out that the murdering children are born with a genetic aberration that expresses itself through the presence of extra kidneys. The children have a profound love of salt. They have innate foraging skills and the impulse to murder their elders. They describe themselves as emissaries from a quote unquote new world, a desert future where the sun is so hot that it pops human eyeballs and food is so scarce that the new people, as they call themselves, must salt and eat their own dead. Here, it seems, is the climate change generation, the next human genre, and not one that anyone wanted or desired. Now, throughout, Liz Jensen refuses to allow the children to be written off by the reader as monsters or as freaks. She stages a very lengthy, in fact, internal conversation at the center of the novel about precisely that friable line between evolutionary adaptation and monstrosity. Finally, our narrator, who remember is an evolutionary anthropologist, decides that these children are human, but they are also, in his words, quote unquote, saviors, bearing the undeserved and astonishing gift of a second chance. It is thanks to them that we discovered a new metaphysics of being. In The Uninvited, Jensen reflects on her own chosen literary genre, which is dystopian fantasy fiction, a genre often aimed at children or about them, by making the future happen within the present in the form of these children, 
who are kin, but at the same time are almost an unknowable new world. She reminds us that fantastic speculative fiction at its best confronts the alter world of the future, not as externalities, but as the present, as the cultural work that we must do now. For adults, parents, educators, the horror and a more abstract threat of dystopia redoubles if we refuse our right to responsibility for those almost unrecognizable kin. Jensen's climate change novels, which include not just The Uninvited, but also the novel The Rapture, engage in a serious biocultural fantasy wherein the reader can only resolve the tense question at the core of the fantastic, which is always what is real, by assuming responsibility for what is given as real, however unthinkable that may be. I have another quote here from Todorov, who wrote the famous book on the fantastic in 1970, where he talks about the fantastic as being the hesitation that's experienced by a person who knows only the laws of nature confronting an apparently supernatural event. So there's that hesitation, what is real, what is fantasy? Am I reading something that I'm to take as realism, or am I reading something that's really kind of wildly exaggerated, hyperbolic, and fantastic or magical? Well, in that space of hesitation, what Jensen suggests as a fantasy writer who approaches climate change is you have to simply go with the fact that, yes, this seemingly unthinkable thing is real, and then act responsibly and accordingly. Um, and it's an interesting way to think about sort of plunging into negative capability or plunging into the fantastic as a kind of abyss. Now, I call this serious biocultural fantasy, um, as I've said, and I think failing to recognize the hesitation of the fantastic as an invitation to transformative change will be fatal in these novels. Jensen's novels make explicit an argument that's also present in many of the now 40-some titles of adult fiction, young adult fiction in English that treat climate change. So there are about 40 novels or so that are YA novels targeting a young adult, adult audience and that are about climate change. And like Liz Jensen's work, they're novels that very much advocate for taking the future as the present and thinking about the future not as that which we speculate on abstractly, but that which we act on now. Um, I would argue, of course, that young adult fiction shares Jensen's critique of and challenge uh, to building out the social category of the adult. There are a lot of failures uh, in these young adult fictions about climate change, people who are not really working out what it means to be an adult and how it, it, it can be that we can still continue to teach and to learn from younger generations. These typically are not pious environmental screeds about saving the children, by the way, but rather warnings about being possessed, emptied, forsaken, and murdered by the children if we, the implied adult readers, fail to recognize the material limits and affordances of their futures and how the biocultural inscription of humanness will shift. There are, these are novels where the ontological insecurity of losing the late modern inscription of humanness, liberal humanism, becomes ontological horror a shiver at the very foundation of being. There are a lot of really good YA fictions. And we know now that YA fictions are often are bought by adults or they're bought by people in their 20s and their 30s. So these fictions about young adults are fictions about being an adult, about what it means to be, again, responsible, to have the gift of responsibility for your own future. Um, and that gift of responsibility is unfortunately also a gift of ontological horror at this particular moment. So the novels suggest. So on the far edge of Holocene climate, the specter of the loss of one's children, of what one may have imagined as a continuation of the self imbricated within a specific history, resembles the loss of one's children, one's continuance to another country, to a country or home place, without the stable relationship to the bios once understood as climate. We are all immigrants now, young adult climate fiction suggests to its readers, many of whom, of course, are going to be adults in their 20s and 30s. We are anticipating children who speak another tongue, who practice distinct cultural habits, who have little need of us, these fictions suggest. From the point of view of the wealthy world and its most privileged, these novels of failing adulthood, failure to educate, and simply failing to play the role of the insider in the contest for what is real, point to a coming redistribution of knowledge, skill, and power, some kind of social upheaval often vague. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the most lively, if not affirmative, expressions of climate change culture have come in the United States from indigenous and African-American thinkers, 
those who've already known the end of worlds and lived past them. Kyle Powis White, who's a Potawatomi philosopher, proposes the conservation of what species are crucial to cultural survival and which are left as a pragmatic method of living with climate change. He talks a lot about conservation as that which is not spoken enough in climate change discourse and why it's necessary for tribal communities. This kind of conservation already uh, is well thought out and a part of traditional ecological knowledges and the way that they move into governmental action within tribal communities, according to White. Now, whether the novel and the edifice of subjectivity that it helped to erect, a unique expression of cultural memory and empiricist desire, will count as such necessary objects of conservation remains to be seen. In the meantime, climate fiction may at the least point to the need for an extended humanism or post-humanist practice. I myself like the idea of the re-enchantment of humanism, which is a title given to an interview with Sylvia Winter by David Scott. And I'm just gonna end the talk with a quote from Sylvia Winter, the Jamaican uh, novelist, uh, actress, theatrical writer, and philosopher. She says, when situations change in the way we behave, oriented by the adaptive ways in which we law likely know self, other, and world are no longer adaptive, as is now so urgently in our contemporary case, how can we come to know our reality outside the terms that had been adapted to a reality that is now past and gone? How can we think outside the terms in which we are? Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for this informative talk. So I wanted to ask if we're gonna teach people like or show them more about uh, this cli using the cli-fi mm -hmm. uh, genre or theory and for example, the movies or art. Uh, is it enough also to make them move or do actions? As you said, they know about it, but maybe they don't really care so much. Mm -hmm. So how can this also influence them to just do actions, like to feel like their daily life or their lifestyle is also affecting this climate change? Mm -hmm. So each one has their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I certainly don't think cli-fi alone is going to bring people to positive action to remediate climate change. But what I do think it does is I think it creates a kind of ambiance of the normal for climate change. Oddly enough, I'm talking about crazy fantasy fictions and speculative fictions, but the more that these fictions come out, the more that our cultures are saturated by them, the more that our cultures find the popular imagination to be engaging with, discussing in some fashion, however unrealistic at times, climate change, the more that that's part of the popular imagination, I think the more that we see climate change as a kind of background condition for all action. And that's one of the crucial things that I think these artists are trying to bring into being. Uh, almost a, a, it's almost like a shifting of what the ground of realism is. In Amitav Ghosh's work, he talks about how realism has been kind of corroborated to or, or kind of uh, correlated to um, the geography of Charles Lyell and this very sort of slow idea of geologic development and, and natural change and how realism is temperate, at least in the sort of Western imagination and what we call literary realism within the Anglo uh, canon. You know, this is, this is very, sort of a very temperate, modest, um, modest kind of realism where big changes don't occur. And his question is, can popular culture, can storytelling, can film, can fiction change the tempo of the normal? so that we recognize that things are changing really rapidly and what we call the real needs to adjust to that tempo. And I think that's a really fascinating question. Um, in terms of action in my own teaching, I try to show students ways to engage. So, you know, I give them uh, an assignment where I have them chase a particular commodity, a favorite commodity of theirs through all of the different structures that brought it into being. 
and I call it a biography of your favorite thing. You know, so if your favorite thing is Starbucks coffee, well, where did the coffee come from? Where did the cup come from? How well is the person paid? Who is the barista? Who, what other labor was involved getting that cup of coffee to you? Um, you know, what, how, does, how do we make paper to make that cup? What are the processes of industrial paper making? So they have to kind of trace out all the different ways in which this particular commodity, which is their favorite thing, has a life cycle. And in doing that, um, you know, you begin to see yourself in this sort of broad array of systems that not everybody is aware of. I mean, I think some people may come to school with the knowledge of that, but many people do not. And when you have that sort of systemic awareness of self, it becomes easier, I think, to figure out where to insert yourself in these systems and begin to make some sort of change. Is my insertion at the point of, of consumption, do I not want to buy Starbucks coffee anymore? Or do I want to protest the ways in which industrial paper making is happening in my region and how we're polluting rivers and streams? Um, do I want to become an engineer who finds a new way to create paper or something other than paper in which to put this coffee? You know, where, where in the system do I want to see myself intervening and what are the possible routes for intervention? Um, I think those kinds of questions are really important as starting questions. And sometimes I'll bring in experts uh, in different fields to talk a little bit about, well, you know, this is what we're doing instead of paper making now, or this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of work you could do to change the way that uh, coffee is traded and the kinds of, um, you know, labor exploitation that's often involved in coffee production. So there, there are all sorts of things um, that can be brought into a story of one's favorite commodity that are little openings for agency and for action. Um, and that's just an assignment that I like to offer. But I also like to try to set students up with, with um, groups on campus or with you know, regional groups that are doing some sort of important work. Um, I think we all want to be useful in this moment. Um, my sense is that students really want a positive course of action, and they want a pathway. And so if you offer no pathway and only this grief, or worse yet, an apocalyptic scenario, um, you know, you're basically just telling them, go to the mall, buy something, make yourself feel better. You know, <laughs> you're, you're kind of committing an act of, of, I don't know, just irresponsibility as a teacher. You know? So that's a, it's a great question. I think my answer is probably really long-winded, but I hope it was somewhat helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, really liked the cli fi framing and really liked the Anthropocene and you know all the quotes. So many thanks for your time and, and for sharing that with us. I'm limiting myself to two questions. I've got a lot, but I've just I've got two if that's all right. Um, the first one is, um, you know, one of the main things about climate change is the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. And really this shared collective resource that nobody has ownership over. Um, what role do you see cli-fi kind of bringing that to the consciousness of the global citizenry and then also kind of acting on that? Mm -hmm. Which leads to the second question, which is, you know, what does a really good cli-fi book achieve? You know, is it like a Game of Thrones equivalent where you kind of, you know, have this new movement or is it kind of more, the more cli-fi we have, the more consciousness we develop that therefore mm -hmm. we kind of slowly empower this consciousness? Mm -hmm. um, your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, I think that, you know, one of the issues that your second question brings up is the fact that... Uh, Cultural change happens in an iterative way, and it's slow. And we don't really have time <laughs> to be that slow, right? So uh, what is this for? Well, I think in part it's for literally adjusting the notion of what it means to be human as other kinds of interventions are taking place. Um, I don't see cli-fi as affecting political will in the United States very much, um, but I do think it can affect some of the partisanship and the, the sort of anger between political groups by simply making something popular that is almost taboo and almost unspeakable. And there have been other unspeakables, like slavery, for instance, in the, in the US, which were made tolerable, at least for discussion on the popular level, by a kind of influx of popular cultural expression, slave narratives, novels, et cetera. Um, so to go to your first question about the commons, one of the things that I like best about some cli-fi projects, and this is a roundabout way to go to the commons, is that they are collective 
So there have been several collective storytelling projects that are cli-fi projects where students, uh, for instance, at Columbia University were asked to do a DIY, do-it-yourself cli-fi uh, project called Future Coast with Ken Eklund, a game designer who also created the game World Without Oil, a massive multiplayer game that involved over a thousand players. And um, Ken was able to get these students, and then my students played the game. I had 200 students playing it one, one quarter. Um, our students would call in a short narrative, uh, just a one minute narrative as a telephone message about something that was happening in their region projected out to 2020, 2030, 2050 that was a scientifically based cli-fi scenario. Somebody might call in a story as, an e as, a, as a phone message to their mother, you know, talking about the inability to get fresh water in the region and making some kind of small statement about that. When you put all those stories together, they begin to form a region-by-region region portrait in the United States of possible futures. Not all of them were disastrous. Some of them were, but not all of them were. Some of them were about things like, you know, we have these grading, great floating houses and floating elementary schools in Alaska now. Um, did you want to come by and see my new floating home, et cetera? That kind of collective project, I think, makes the point that not only should we think about the atmosphere as a commons, but that storytelling narrative itself is a kind of commons. And how do we shepherd it? How do we come together and speak across differences, across regional identities, across politics even, to shepherd the story of a climate future together? So that's one approach to the commons question. Um, other approaches, I mean, I think it's very hard to think structurally within the novel. There's much more of an individualistic focus in a lot of novels anyway, where the commons per se isn't probably as uh, available to the imagination as it should be. But I do think there's some really interesting novels, which I would call post-human novels. One of them that comes to mind readily for me is Jeff Vandermeer's novel, uh, Vandermeer's novel Acceptance, where what you see is all biotic life as a commons that has been exploited, that has been misused, but that essentially is taking revenge. <laughs> so you have a kind of revenge of the bios on those who have abused, exploited, and individualistically misunderstood its importance. And what happens at the end of novels like that is that you have no longer a human center, but these kind of human uh, animal or human plant even hybrid creatures who've come into being the idea being that the human is extinguished um, in a world where the commons has not been respected and regarded and the commons takes its revenge. But the revenge is also beautiful. And the novel isn't trying to say, you know, hate this world, uh, this nature, or this bios, which is somehow always against you and always in a conflictual relationship with you. The novel is actually saying, no, this is a beautiful world with its own meanings. You have failed to hear them. And the result of your failure is you are no longer at the center of the novel. <laughs> but a plant is, you know, or a plant with a face. So I do think, in certain ways, the commons are addressed by these novels. And I also think that the idea of collective storytelling, and even certain kinds of socially conscious games, uh, like Eklund's World Without Oil, which is a fascinating game, have been really productive in terms of, of shepherding a common future for some groups of people who've been involved with them. So I don't have I don't have a well formed question, but I maybe I would like to ask you um, it's, it's a follow up comment on what I just heard right. that there is even in this uh, description that you just gave us of this last um, novel there is a, a, a implicit Spinozianism in mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. there is so many of these uh, Anthropocene and and post human literature novels they recover in fact, in negative or positive ways, something of this Spinozan mm -hmm. moment, right? Mm -hmm. Decentered human. Mm -hmm. But that's not what you did today, That which mm -hmm. was very no. interesting to me, right? Mm -hmm. That is right, was what was really striking to me, that you went to a different enlightenment mm -hmm. via Stigler, mm -hmm. who, is, who is recovering a notion of 
adult from Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. I mean, he goes into what is enlightenment very specifically mm -hmm. for a notion of human. And mm -hmm. that's really striking because, mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to see whether you want to talk about that, about why that choice, that is a very different choice from other mm -hmm. uh, views of this, if you want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be interested to hear from you, and I suspect you know more about the philosophy than I do, about how we might think of those two in, as in any way complementary because the Spinozan influence on new materialist thinking is one that I'm very well aware of, and I think new materialism and posthumanism, though not identical, have moved together in some of these posthuman novels or Anthropocene fictions. Um, and I find those really interesting ways of thinking. I mean, I'm, I, I'm excited by the decentering of the human, I'm excited about the dissolution of a certain version of humanism, but I also keep coming back to what I guess is something like an extended humanism uh, from the Enlightenment tradition, something like the reenchantment of humanism, partly because I feel as if the decentering of the human is always a thought experiment that, that leads me to uh, a very complex, if not impossible, politics. That might just be the limits of my own imagination speaking, but I don't quite know how to get to pathway thinking, to specific action from the, dis the dissolve of, the, of humanism that I have experienced through new materialism, through posthumanist thought, even though I think that's a really useful and profound kind of experiment. Um, so I, I guess I'm just more interested in um, what I would call humanism plus or the extension of humanism. I've talked to my own students about what they think human nature is, and they say again and again, human nature is praxis. Human nature is praxis. It's, it's what you do. It's what you do. But it's also very human. <laughs> you know, you, you, may be, you may be aware that the, that the bios doesn't care about you, that you're actually not transcendent, that you're not really in control even. But you, you kind of always come back to the fact that, well, you are this, this, self, this sort of self-storing animal, which is human. That's what I, you know, I, I love that part of Winter's thinking, because to me, it's, it's pragmatic. I have the microphone, so I get to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> this is a much more formal room than I normally speak in, so I have to, I'm kind of shocked by the, sort of the mic and, you know, but, yeah. yes. Um, I'm curious about the YA stuff. I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting, and it's, I'm wondering um, if it's in part the idea of addressing the YA audience, which we know is, is you know, anything from 12-year-olds to, you know, 60-year-olds, but call it YA, um, as a way of sort of giving up on um, the Holocene sort of mm -hmm. generation. But then I wondered if there's a way in which that's also a rebuttal to what you call the great coinage, um, petromelancholia, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, my kids, for instance, have no idea that there was a time when gas was, cars were big and gas was cheap and, you know, then, and then we moved here and they were like, oh, it's like that, right, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but so I, I'm just curious if you can kind of put those two things together, sort of the YA and as a maybe response to petromelancholia and or a sort of giving up on one generation in hopes that we can scare the other, the next generation into doing things differently. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, those are really interesting thoughts, and I, I'm not sure. I haven't thought those thoughts. So I'm going to put them sort of beside my own thoughts and then maybe come back to them, um, because I like them. Uh, for me, the, the young adult fiction that I've been reading, that is climate fiction, um, is, I think, directed at the adults who are reading young adult fiction as much as the young adults who are reading it, or the teenagers. And I think that it's about um, not, a lot of it I think is about not having the skills to be the parents you need to be in this moment, um, which literally might mean not being able to do things like create flood barriers for your home um, or you know, not being able to teach your child that that child can no longer bathe more than once a month because of water scarcity and that a whole new sociality is gonna to have to come into being in which not bathing can somehow be rendered 
sexually attractive. <laughs> like, you know, how do you, how do you, there's a whole, there's a wonderful a series by Saki Lloyd, who is a, um, both a grammar school teacher and a writer in England, where she literally has a whole section on post-carbon dating, which is, of course, a bit of a pun on carbon dating as a process, scientific process, but it's all about well, what do you do, how do you date in a post-fossil fuel world where there are all kinds of scarcities that uh, may be presented to us. How do you make yourself attractive to somebody? How do you, you know? <laughs> and I think, you know, and the parents in those novels have no idea how to answer those questions because these conditions are new. Um, and I feel like the, these novels are almost novels about sort of meta skill. Like we can't, the novels can't give you the skill about, you know, how to, for instance, protect your house against flood. But it can say to you, well, there are these new sets of skills that you might not have thought you needed as parents, but actually you do. Or you at least need to pass these skills along as things that are necessary for your children. Um, it, that whole idea of skilling up, um, and that's actually a phrase that I've heard used in transition movement discussions, is one that I think presents itself in interesting ways in these novels. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> And thanks for your questions.